So just start that as well. So yes, thank you for everyone joining. As I said, my name is Anya Leonard and I'm the founder and director of Classical Wisdom. So today we have three champions in the cause of the ancient world and in particular showing the huge benefits of ancient philosophy of Stoicism. Uh, Karen Duffy is the New York best time selling author of Model Patient and most recently Wise Up, Irreverent Enlightenment from a Mother Who's Been Through It. She is a producer, actress, and former MTV VJ. She has written for the New York Times. She's a Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal, the O, Oprah Magazine. She lives in New York. And I believe this morning she was on Good Morning America and is now joining us live uh, to our whole fans and classicalism and stoicism crowd. So we also have, we're very grateful for you, uh, Duff, to join us today. We're very excited. Uh, and we're going Thank to be you. talking about your new book, Wise Up, as well. So it's really, really exciting. Uh, our, our next panelist is Nancy Sherman. She is a New York Times notable author. Her most recent book is Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. She is also the author of After War, Healing the Moral Wounds of Our Soldiers. Uh, the Untold War Inside the Hearts, Minds, and Souls of Our Soldiers was a New York Times editor's pick and Stoic Warriors, uh, The Ancient Philosophy Behind the Military Mind and making a necessity of a virtue, Aristotle and Kant on the virtue and fabric of character, Aristotle's theory of virtue. Uh, as you can see, Nancy is very prolific. So we have quite a few excellent books that she's written and I hope you guys have read them. And if you haven't, you can get to do that as well. Um, the editor, she's also the editor of Critical Essays on the Classics, Aristotle's Ethics. She's written over 60 articles in the areas of ethics, military ethics, history of moral philosophy, ancient ethics, the emotions, moral psychology, and psychoanalysis. And she has delivered over 60 named or keynote lectures around the world. So Nancy uh, also holds the distinguished rank of university professor at Georgetown University. And our final panelist is thank Donald you. Robertson. <laughs> yes, thank you for joining as well. Um, and Donald's actually the only one I've had the pleasure of meeting in real life, uh, which is so rare these days. So uh, we actually got to hang out in the Stoa in Athens. So just that's my Stoic street cred, so to speak. Um, so Donald is the president of Plato's Academy Center. He is a writer, trainer, cognitive behavioral psychotherapist. Is a dual UK and Canadian citizen with permanent residence in Greece. He is the author of six books on philosophy and psychotherapy, including How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, a bestseller that crosses genres combining history, philosophy, and modern psychology. Donald is one of the founding members of the British nonprofit organization called Modern Stoicism, which promotes Greek Stoic philosophy and aims to make it accessible and relevant to the general public. And just a very quick note before we begin, um, we're going to do a few points on the discussion, uh, but feel free to write in questions into the chat at any time. We will address questions a little bit later on. Um, and if you can, please write who you would like to answer the question or if it's a general question. Um, and again, please keep your mics and videos off. It's sort of like being in a movie theater, keep your cell phones away. This is this is modern etiquette in the world of Zooms. Um, so again, I wanna thank our wonderful panelists for joining us today. And I'd like to start, if uh, we may, with Duff. Um, you, you've just written this excellent book, Wise Up, which I highly recommend to everybody. It's really, really enjoyable. And I remember Nancy, when you read it, you said it's lighthearted, but very wise. And I thought that just encapsulated it perfectly. <laughs> Um, and, and one of the first points about it is finding a philosophy for life, which I just think is really important. So Duff, maybe you can help us with, um, can everyone find a philosophy for life? And sort of what is a philosophy for life? Well, if you have a sense of how the world works, uh, how to behave towards others, how to treat, how to be a friend to yourself, then you already have a philosophy for life. Um, and it's interesting uh, because presenting the Stoic ideas to a new audience, there's this sense that philosophers and Stoics are in black turtlenecks and berets smoking their galas down to the filter. <laughs> and the great thing is, is Stoicism is joyful, it's practical. We use the lessons of the ancient Stoics in everyday life. And what I love about it, it was written over 20 centuries ago, but it reads as if the ink is still wet. 
Um, so we all have a philosophy for life, whether or not we know it. And I, uh, when I started reading Epictetus, who's my main man in Stoic philosophy, um, the idea that he has, if you make beautiful choices, you will make a beautiful life, that reverberated through me like a cherry bomb in a silverware drawer. I was like, yes, that's it. We are the sum of our choices. So I believe we all have a philosophy for life. And uh, the more you read philosophy, you may have an idea of where it best suits you. I think that's so well said. And, and it is so important to find a philosophy of life for life. And today, one of the First things I'd really like to talk about is is with regards to health, um, both physical and mental. And you know, this was something I wanted to say to people before. If you're suffering through something like anxiety or chronic pain or illness or loss right now, you know, the stoicism is extremely helpful and, and can have a lot of wonderful tactics. But even if you aren't suffering it right now, I think it's important to to prepare because inevitably there will be a moment in your life when when you have something that happens. So uh, I kind of like to think of it as like if you're in a, in a building, uh, a burning building, or there's an earthquake, and you have to get down a lot of flights of stairs, you want to hope that you're physically fit enough to do that. So instead of being physically fit here, or we need to be mentally fit, we need to be philosophically fit and, and soulful about these things. Um, and, uh, and to prepare in advance for when this inevitably will happen to our own lives. So um, Duff, you have uh, been very vocal about your situation with regards to chronic pain and, and having a progressive disease. Um, can you maybe help us out a little bit, share kind of what, what, what you've gone through with regards to handling chronic illness and how stoicism can help with that? Well, thank you. Um, I, I live with a very rare disease it's called sarcoidosis of the central nervous system. Um, but I also have something called complex regional pain syndrome. And uh, that is essentially what it's like to live with chronic pain. It's, you, there's an a, a interruption in my central nervous system. And so my brain is constantly saying like, there's a problem here, there's a problem here. So it's almost as if I've had someone screaming in my ear all the time. And I realized, you know, it's interesting that uh, physical health is just riddled with all these warlike metaphors. You're going to fight this disease. We're going to battle it. We're going to blast those cells and you're going to be a warrior and kind of reject the warlike metaphors because I'm a lover, not a fighter. And I thought, like, I need a new way to think about this. And um, my whole life changed pretty much overnight. And I realized that, okay, this pain is here to stay, but pain is inevitable. We will all experience pain, physical or mental anguish. But at some point, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And while I live in chronic pain, I do not suffer. I actually squeeze as much good out of every day. And I would say, uh, I am so grateful for the lessons of the Stoics who have really jimmied up my confidence and have given me uh, this illuminating idea of how to live my life with purpose. I mean, we have a choice to be useful or useless. And I believe the Stoics really inspire us to be useful. Yeah, it's, it's um, it, I thought in your book, you, you mentioned a few sort of specific ways too of handling chronic illness. One of which I thought was a really beautiful one, which was sort of finding happiness, even on low levels, like enjoying small moments in life, whether it's, you know, one of my favorite moments in the week is on a Saturday morning when I get to drink my coffee at just the right temperature and sit and read my book. And, you know, my daughter's at the other end of the couch playing. And it's just that like moment of tranquility um, and, and sort of finding those moments in life uh, and, and, and appreciating them. Yep. And being a friend to yourself. Um, th there's, it's interesting. There is a lot of shame connected with physical infirmity, 
chronic illness, especially because it's invisible. It's really, what is happening is inside my spinal column. So I look like I'm fairly healthy and it's confusing to others. So I've really tried to use my voice um, and my experience to share with others that you can look well, but actually be really suffering. It's like I wake up in the morning and I pick up a refrigerator and I have to carry it all day and then mm -hmm. go to bed with it on top of me. So it's a heavy lift, as you, as you sound like you understand, Nancy. Well, you speak so uh, from the heart and invisible wounds are absolutely real wounds. They may be mm -hmm. invisible, you know, the term sometimes comes up with war, but they're real. Mental health is part of health, whether it's neurologically uh, disabling in your case, or psychologically disabling, or uh, brain issues that we don't really understand. Think of Virginia Woolf, one of my favorite authors. I mean, we, she suffered remarkably from bipolar, which wasn't even diagnosed at that time. They had no real medicines other than convalescence. So yeah, really time to take seriously um, the reality of mental health, um, whether it's visible or invisible. In the military, they got they tried to get rid of the D in post-traumatic stress um, disorder because many felt, well, they're coming home from terrible situations with limb injuries, not limb disorders. I mean, you know, let's not, they found it stigmatizing. Names are only, only goes so far, but just to give you a sense of destigmatization of mental health is a campaign we should all be engaged in wherever we are. So I really feel that so strongly um, as a, a teacher and uh, working with students and um, just in the general community. And Nancy, you've worked with a lot of warriors. I mean, and Duffy was saying before about, you know, there's a language of warriors with, with health, but also warriors need mental health uh, um, acknowledgement and, and, and assistance. And so are, are there some ways that, that Nancy, you've worked a lot with, with uh, the military that, that stoicism can help specifically uh, people who have come from the military experience or yeah. and generally PTS? Yeah. However you want to call it. Yeah, labels are labels. Um, well, first of all, just a, um, an absolute from the heart uh, applaud to you, Duff. Uh, it was such a fun book to read, so inspiring, and puts in perspective um, the little aches and pains in life that are so little um, compared to what you're going through and what those who suffer go through, whether you call it suffering or not. And um, also um, letter to a child. I'm, I'm a parent of two, old at this point with their own children. And, and um, you're always a mom or a parent. Um, and you're always thinking about um, how best you model for them and what your lessons are, whether you're writing. I don't write letters, but I thought the idea of writing letters was terrific. I'm, you know, I think my kids won't write back, but... <laughs> I can barely get thank you notes out of them. <laughs> that said, um, I do work with military um, and I continue to. And one of the mantras that just drove me up a wall and continues to do so is uh, you find it throughout the military, embrace the suck or suck it up and truck on. And it was, a Donald will agree, a kind of bastardization of Epictetus. Um, and... I sort of had a mission, if, especially because I was involved in um, observing and called into the Pentagon to think quite hard about suicide uh, in the military where there was an epidemic at, during these forever wars that now have somewhat ended. Um, but that people were coming home with um, limb injuries, but mental injuries that were just not being taken care of. So suck it up and truck on just seemed a horrible way to deal with this. So I really wanted to think of a, a gentler stoicism that was not a, that was uh, facing your vulnerability, um, having ways of thinking about vulnerability, um, ways of connecting. I strongly believe as we're doing here in the 
a power of community, not not go it alone, self reliance, if that, even if that's our tradition. But you, we see this remarkable resilience in Ukraine. You can't help but be on your minds. And they are part of a community, whether you believe in nation states or not. Well, that, um, but we certainly believe in the self defense against aggressors and crimes against humanity. And the solidarity that comes from some have said, well, this will give you a palette for thinking about stoicism. Well, these are, you know, these are citizen soldiers to say the least. Um, and they really are, I think, being stoic in the best way. They're connecting with each other. They find a cause that's worthy. And they seem to have ways of healing even I mean, they won't heal fully. We know that it would be a myth. Um, the, the trauma is just there and the adrenaline's there. But one thing I just wanna say is that stoicism is fabulous in understanding the emotions. And one of the ways they think about emotions is, is um, multi-leveled. There's the arousal emotions, the, all those signals you're getting in your ear that aren't really you, but are autonomic or neurological or whistles and bells and triggers, et cetera. And then there's, emotions that you really experience it can run amok because of excess or they're attached to the wrong objects um and then there's kind of calm this calm that you know rational caution rational joy rational desire they call them the good emotions but the first ones are what mobilize us you know your knees knock you get a little sweaty before a performance you'll probably understand that one deaf um, you know, your voice may wobble a little bit before you have to go sing your, uh, you know, your aria. Um, performance time. When I lectured 150, I got to kind of rev myself up because there's a little nerves that are going on. A combat medic in the front lines of Ukraine said this, and it was could have been straight out of Seneca on Anger, book two, chapter two. My knees knock before... I deal with a compression wound and I see it. That's nerves, but it goes away fast and then I do my work. That could be Seneca who says it comes on unbidden, but then you could bid it adieu, goodbye in some ways if you have some control. So I think it's very, uh, it's so relevant and, and I couldn't but think of that example, those a, a new, fresh, horrible, horrible war with individuals facing it with humanity. It's, yeah. yeah, there's there's um, so much wisdom in that, that thinking about that you're gonna face something difficult, but to know that you can get past it. And I know Duff, in your book, you referenced a few times Taleb as well, that somebody who talks about anti-fragile. And I think that's a, a really common stoic belief in a way of, of a, imagining situations that we know we can then overcome or practicing even if it's like sleeping on the floor from time to time to know that we can endure difficulties and and even sort of micro dosing suffering at times so that when we have difficult moments we know how to overcome them um and there's a, a bunch of other ones that i know uh, i'd love to turn to you donald because you you speak specifically about uh chronic um <laughs> behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, sorry. Uh, and so you, you often talk about very the practical elements in, in stoicism that can also help with things like anxiety or anger. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I was going to start with a little bit of trivia, actually. There's a, a philosopher called Bion of Boristenes, who's pretty obscure, like not one of the best known ones, but he was kind of a quasi cynic philosopher and he came from Ukraine. And uh, he's one of the precursors of the Stoics, actually. And one of the things he was known for doing was he had these beautiful metaphors that you find in classical literature, which become very pertinent today um, in terms of understanding quite nuanced psychological practices. Um, so Nancy talked about this kind of suck it up thing. The researchers know there are lots of different coping strategies, as we call them, that people use to deal with their emotions. We can kind of categorize them and stuff. There's good ones, there's bad ones, different types of coping strategies. But very, you know, the advice I give to people these days tends to get kind of simpler and simpler, I find, as I get older. And, you know, the number one most popular coping strategy that most people use to deal with anxiety is avoidance, basically, because it's the easiest one and it gets the quickest results. Um, but it's not, generally speaking, the healthiest strategy. 
And in fact, a, a lot of research these days converges on the idea that learning to do the opposite of avoiding our feelings, like learning to actually embrace them and experience them more fully and kind of allow them to run their course naturally. It gives our brain an opportunity to process emotions more naturally. And so Bion and Boristhenes and the cynics have a lot of metaphors for that. They say it's better if you want to stamp out a fire to do it confidently rather than to do it gingerly. You're less likely to get injured that way. They say that boxers that advance confidently towards their enemy get less injured than ones that are kind of trying to back away gingerly. Um, they say that somebody who's faced with ferocious wild dogs should stand up tall and face them down rather than trying to run away from them. They'll get more savage that way. So really what they're referring to is this idea that when we experience chronic pain or acute pain or anxiety feelings, um, rather than trying to block them out or run away from them or avoid them, certainly the longer term, those strategies in a number of ways are known to often backfire. And so learning to experience unpleasant feelings in a more healthy and constructive way um, we know is healthier. And the, you know, the, the ancient Greeks in general, but particularly the Stoics, just had a more nuanced understanding of our emotions and a more sophisticated understanding than many people even have today. Um, they were the pioneers of the cognitive model of emotion. Again, one of the simplest pieces of advice I could give people about anxiety or any emotions is we talk about anxiety, we talk about pain, we talk about anger, sadness, using what psychologists sometimes call the lump theory of emotion, as if it's just a thing. There's this thing called anxiety, like, and there could be a lot of it, or a little bit of it. It's kind of a homogenous blob or something. And, and that's the crudest way of understanding emotion. If we had a more subtle way of understanding it, we'd think, well, maybe anxiety is a cake that's baked from lots of different ingredients. You know, maybe there's different types of thoughts and underlying beliefs. There's different types of bodily sensation. There's different action or behavioral tendencies. And all these things combine to bake the cake of anxiety. And if we understand that it's made of different bits, we might then be able to make distinctions. We might go, well, some aspects of anxiety maybe are involuntary, they're reflex-like and automatic. And maybe other aspects of anxiety are more directly under our voluntary control. Like, and that, that allows us, the more we understand anxiety and see it in a more intricate way, the more control we naturally have over it. So I think uh, the, the ancient Stoics did that. They analyzed their emotions, they understood them cognitively. You know, that's the very first step that we can make as a society and as individuals in terms of gaining uh, better emotional intelligence and emotional health. Can I just add to that? Um, thank you, Donald. Um, I think it's really important. Cicero, who wasn't a Stoic, but a, a traveler and one of our best sources for Stoicism, um, made it very clear that he was finding the ancient Greek Stoics uh, texts and that they had these two layers of emotions, at least two tiered, I sometimes say. And one is you make a kind of cognitive judgment about the bear that's in front of you, however uh, unconscious, you know, you don't have to spell it out. And then again, however unconscious, action tendency was your word, you know, what's the way to go? You have to practice that in advance. I mean, when we, <laughs> when I was hiking, um, I think Donald maybe far north where there are mountains, but when I was hiking um, in Colorado or in Wyoming, you know, bears. So I kept thinking bears, you know, what will my response to bears be? You know, and I had my bells and my, my spray, et cetera. And I kept thinking, you, you don't want to pre-traumatize yourself clearly, but you do want to have some advanced practice of the bads, rehearse the bads a little bit so they don't blindsight you. And I think that's why the philosophy of life that stoicism offers is so helpful. It is a, a, to practice in advance what you would rather avoid. Um, and, you know, death being one of those things. Um, but um, it's really, um, um, don't inure yourself, but expose yourself a bit. Um, in what we now call prolonged exposure therapy. One little quick word, post-traumatic stress is one form of anxiety. It manifests as anxiety and many other things, hypervigilance um, and numbing. Um, 
uh, and kind of getting away from things and flashbacks. But there's also moral injury where you're not, it's not the anxiety of fear or the response to fear, but it's the response to uh, moral stuff happening you can't control or you perpetrate, um, you know, every part of life we're agents and every part of life we are vic if not victims acted upon you know as a parent as a partner as a colleague um in the world what we do and we also watch you know we don't have to be war journalists to to watch stuff happening where we feel implicated where we should have done could have done and those emotions of <clears throat> guilt shame, resentment, betrayal, are the stuff the Stoics talk a lot about. And they're very good on that. And that is what today we call often, I call it the emotions of moral injury. It's a pop, you know, it's a very hot term right now. And like any hot term, they're never defined easily in the press or in the public sphere. But it is the a feeling of a shattered conscience or a, a challenged conscience that manifests in these kinds of emotions we're talking about that the Stoics are so good about describing. Anger, uh, they don't use the word guilt, but it's not easily there. Shame, they do use. Um, distrust, betrayal. I was going to say maybe moral injury is, is more of a common thing to worry about than bears, but actually in Duff, your book, you also <laughs> ran into a bear. So there might be more bear interactions uh, than I had uh, anticipated. And I should say, though, also, Nancy, your, your point about preparing against things. Um, please, everyone, don't try to get into bear enclosures to try to prepare uh -huh. yourself for future bear incidences. I just want to make sure that's not what we're recommending. Um, <laughs> But I mean, so we've talked about a lot of, a, you know, trauma and, and stress and anxiety, but I'd like to pivot for a moment to talk about sort of the healthy relationships in our lives and, and how stoicism can also help on the positive way. Uh, it doesn't have to be just to preempt bad. Um, and that's another thing that, that is quite a running theme in your book, Duff, is about motherhood and relationships. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I kind of wanted to ask how stoicism can help at home. And uh, maybe Duff, you can start us off with, with, with regards to our relationships as, as children and as parents. Um, well, thank you. Uh, in our house, we have a no tech at the table rule. And having a teenager who's at the breakfast table often wasn't really chatty. So I would just fill up the table, you know, eggs, toast, and philosophy books, and mainly of our esteemed colleagues in front of us, uh, Nancy and Donald's books. So my so my son grew up when he didn't feel like chatting, just perusing. It's interesting. I read this controversial statistic that says that the average adolescent boy speaks six thousand words a day, and the average adolescent female speaks twenty four thousand words a day. So I figured, all right, we'll give him a chance. So what I love is, uh, you know, Jack internalizing this, like, you know, as we were talking about being prepared, you know, uh, he said, you know, you know, remember, as Aristotle said, it is expected that unexpected things should happen when there's a small incident. I love hearing my lad parroting it back to me. Um, and, uh, you know, we were talking about just being prepared and uh, what I get, uh, what I seek in the Stoics and what I see is like this radiance love of life. And I feel quite connected to Epictetus for his writings, uh, but also he uh, is always shown with his crutch and uh, I, he lived with chronic pain. He, he was enslaved. Epictetus means acquired, and his leg was broken by a sadistic master. And so maybe one of the things I connect with him is that he also lived with chronic pain. And, um, and that was just a way to almost explain to my son, well, you know, this is the way I live, many people do, and actually the people from history do as well. You might even think that in history, people had more pain regularly. I mean, now at least we have so much modern medicine. And I mean, I'm sure anybody who's even had a, 
a, a toothache or some ailment. I remember once like biting into a corn chip and half of a tooth coming off. Uh, and I was able to go to a fantastic dentist and get it fixed. And, and the funny thing was I was in Indonesia at the time and they still had amazing dentistry. So, um, you know, worldwide now we, we have access to health um, treatments that can, can reduce this pain. So imagine historically people had even more that they had to worry about. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of issues that we have at home. So we were talking about parenthood. Um, I know Donald, you always like talking about Marcus Aurelius's mother. Um, maybe mm -hmm. you can add in a few points on that. Yeah, I like talking about Marcus Aurelius's <laughs> mother because um, she was an unusual woman. She was uh, a construction magnate, but not a lot of people know that. She owned a, a big brick and tile factory that she inherited from her family. So she was a very wealthy, powerful woman that gathered intellectuals around her. And she was fluent in Greek. Uh, Fronto, who is one of the greatest Latin orators of his era, uh, kind of somewhat pathetically asks Marcus to proofread a letter that he's trying to write to Marcus's mum in Greek because he's worried that he might have got the grammar slightly wrong. So they, these men looked up to her as a, as a great intellectual, in a sense. And uh, Marcus says that the main thing that he got from her was this idea very young, that it wasn't good enough just to avoid wrongdoing in your outward behavior in public, but you also had to try to learn to avoid wrongdoing in your private innermost uh, thoughts. And the interesting thing about that little maxim is you could see that as the seed of the meditations that he wrote decades later. He's still, in a way, trying to work through this little nugget of advice that his mother gave him, which is about self, the examined life, as Socrates calls it, about self-reflection, maybe about mindfulness in a sense. His mum said, you, you need to pay more attention to what's going on inside your mind, like, to observe your own thoughts and, and improve them. And decades later, we get the meditation. We have to thank Marcus Aurelius' mum for the meditations, I think. Can I just say something about mums? <laughs> mums, mo mothers without apple pie. Um, the this is to Duff, the candor with which you speak about parenting and even birthing and the miracle of reproduction um, and IVF and all these things that um, are some used to be taboo, but as a parent of a 40 and 37 year old um, with professions. Um, and, you know, and son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws and all that. Um, these are issues, you know, and, and my generation talking candidly about their children and procreation. It's, they're so important for them not to be hidden. I say this in such gratitude um, from a voice like yours who can speak. Women's issues and bearing children and having children should not be taken for granted. You know, fathers are there too, sperm donors, or you know, solo mothers, single mothers, the whole array, gay parents. All of that is so, for those of us that want to be parents at whatever age, not, you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a stoic moment about that in a sec. I think you, you, you've opened a window that is so critical. So I thank you. It's not typically associated with stoicism, I have to say, but it, but it, but it ought to be. Um, and on that very subject, Philo of Alexandria was a stoic of sorts in many things. He picked up a lot because he was around the time of Seneca. Uh, he's sometimes called Philo Judaeus. Um, and he didn't know, and he wanted to make Sarah as well as Al, uh, Abraham sages, quasi sages, not just Cato and Socrates would do. So he doesn't quite know what to, the, to do with the fact that Sarah laughed when she was told at a, that at a hundred, she would give, give birth to what became Isaac. The word means laugh in Hebrew. And so he sort of says, she has like a nervous laugh. You know, it, it's one of those, <laughs> automatic kinds of things and then she can get over it quickly and move on to a higher stage of emotion so there was stoic dealing with birthing way 
way earlier than we think. <laughs> um, thank you so much. You know, I always find it amazing that because of maternity, the ratio between human bodies and human skeletons is greater than one. The ratio between human bodies and human brains is greater than one. Uh, my friend just gave birth to twins and I was like, wow, at one point you had six set of eyes all in your corpus. I always tell my son um, as he was uh, going into adolescence and I said, mothers are so incredibly righteous that nature had to develop a chemical to break our bond just so you can go out on your life and break from me and not live in my basement. And so that is swimming your cojones and that is the testosterone, testosterone. And part of that will make you think that I am the biggest jackass to come down the pike. Like I will be so irritating. He's like, I really don't think that mom. I mean, we get along great. And I was like, no, there will be a morning where I will bite into a slice of toast and it will be repugnant. It's like, uh, okay, thanks for the warning. Don't think it's happening. Well, one day we were out having dinner and he was like, it happened, but it wasn't toast. It's you jumping into that corn cob like sea biscuit. So I love the fact that um, the way we're almost talking about uh, premeditorio malarium of which is thinking of thinking ahead of what can go wrong. And adolescence, I think, is uh, an obstacle course. Uh, it is a circus of misadventure. So um, preparing myself and then preparing my son has been a, uh, that, that's worked for us and hopefully for others. I think everybody really needs that advice. I'm terrified of the teenage years. So I love to, to get some hints beforehand because you know they're so cute when they're little and you get along so easily, but. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, you're all sticky. I will tell you, <laughs> it just keeps getting better. And at one point you think, oh, this may be ultimate cuteness, but then it just transitions to pride. And now he's on the windowsill ready to fly. And, um, it's a really great feeling. So I will tell you, it's uh, the part of the joy is the challenge. If it was easy and seamless, we wouldn't, it wouldn't mean as much. I think it's, right. it's and, a and challenge. And just on that, Donald Winnicott, a, a British psychoanalyst, as we were saying earlier before we began the program, uh, had a great enough, a wonderful phrase, which was a good enough mother, good enough parent, meaning we we want, we want to be perfect. Um, our children want us to be more than perfect. And <laughs> we got to let go of that. Just as we've got to let go, I think, of the idea of the sage. You know, the wise person doesn't have to be one or two. Socrates was pretty weird, really weird. Um, yes. <laughs> I was teaching him yesterday, boy. So, you know, he's not such a, <laughs> he's not such an unblemished model. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think being grateful, I mean, to go back to the differences between modernity and medicine and, and now like, you know, childbirth is an extremely dangerous activity. <laughs> um, I myself nearly died. I was in intensive care for 10 days, you know, it, and, uh, you know, after an experience like that, you're like, my fact that my daughter has a mother is something to wake up for and be grateful every day. And, you know, I, we, we take not medicine for granted, but um, it really is an amazing development that we've had because it wasn't that long ago that, that one in three women died in childbirth. So it's, it's really improved. <laughs> and so just, just the things to be grateful for. Um, but I'd like to also talk about sort of stoicism. I think everybody who delves into the world of stoicism will know that there's such a common misconception about what stoicism is. And it's, you know, little s versus big s stoicism, this idea that, you know, stiff upper lip and we just bear it and grunt it. But stoicism is, is actually a very fulfilling and, and social philosophy. And I think one thing that we kind of have to work hard to improving our own individual lives, but also in finding community. Uh, and that is a really important element of stoicism. Um, and so I, I'd love to talk about some of the ways that we can find 
stoic communities. Um, and Duff, you, you mentioned specifically, you, you, I don't know if you want to talk about like religion, because um, I know for you, 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 Christianity comes up quite a lot. Uh, but what are some of the other ways you, you find a community through stoicism? Well, uh, through this amazing woman who has classical wisdom, which I is one of the first things I check. Um, uh, I love uh, modern stoicism every year has the great uh, community. Donald with uh, creating the Plato Center. Um, there are many opportunities and I feel deeply, deeply connected. Um, and that's the great thing about what I find about Stoicism is I, I find it to be, yes, communal and joyful. I love how Seneca said, you know, you know, it, it, it is more human to laugh than lament. And I was speaking to some other philosophers and they're like, how come you find all the fun stuff about Stoicism? I'm like, because it's right there. You just, it, it is right there in front of us. Um, and, uh, I find it to be very joyful. You know, my, my new book um, originally started out as a collection of essays and I was working on it and I was in Greece and I was thinking like, I really wanted the reader to feel loved. I, want, I wanted like this sense of radiating off the page. And I thought, well, if I address these letters to the person who I love so deeply and have my son Jack stand in for the reader. Um, it was a bit of a twist to try and express this love, this universal love, this agape um, to the world. And um, so that's been a wonderful thing. I think, you know, as we say like books are a great way to commune and being part of book clubs and, um, there are many opportunities and uh, to create a community or to be a part of a community. And Donald, do you want to add on to some of the uh, communities? I know you're very active in a lot of them, so I feel like I should uh, let you promote some of the great work you've been doing in the Stoic movements. Plug it a bit. I, I, I can remember when, you know, like Stoicism wasn't cool like <laughs> a long time ago, back in the old days when everything was made of wood. I don't know if you can remember that far <laughs> back, but they uh it, was, it wasn't that long about 20 odd, 20 odd years ago or so the, there weren't really that many books on stoicism and then the internet really was the catalyst because there were always people that read marcus aurelius and loved the meditations but they didn't necessarily hang out together and talk to one another there was a kind of stoic diaspora almost like everyone was just dispersed but the internet allowed people to form communities so now we have communities with hundreds of thousands of people in them online and these people can say, oh, I'm into Marcus Aurelius. Are you into Marcus Aurelius too? And they start talking to each other about it, which didn't even exist in, in anything like that scale in the ancient world. You know, the, the Stoicoikale where the Stoics originally met like was relatively, you know, small. I mean, maybe there would have been dozens of Stoics there, maybe a hundred at, at the most. But now we have hundreds of thousands of people interested in Stoicism, forming communities and we have the Modern Stoicism Nonprofit Organization, which Professor Christopher Gill set up um, at Exeter University in the UK. And now that has a, a blog with about 600 articles on it that anyone can contribute to. Uh, it runs the conference every year, the Stoicon Conference, the Stoic Week event. It's just kind of grown. And then the Plato's Academy Center that we started, uh, which is mainly like a kind of virtual community also at the moment, but we're hoping to, to build a, a conference center at the original location of Plato's Academy. Um, so there are many philosophies kind of the new, I like to think that ancient Greek philosophy is the new rock and roll. You know, it's a, <laughs> ancient philosophy is the future, I think. I like to say, you know, and- That's uh, all dance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely the way forward. And I, one thing I'd say about, I, I've, there's all these little bits of trivia that keep, keep coming into my head. When, you, um, we, when you're all talking about preparing for the future, the, one of the pioneers of behavior therapy or CBT in the 1960s was a guy called Arnold Lazarus. And the phrase, sometimes one of the coolest things is, is just having a good metaphor or a good phrase. So Lazarus uh, liked to talk to his clients about emotional fire drills. So everyone knows what a fire drill is when you kind of prepare just in case like uh, a real fire happens. And Lazarus thought that by exposing ourselves 
mentally or even like in reality to challenging events, we could have a kind of rehearsal. We could have a, an emotional fire drill that would help us to develop emotional resilience. Another bit of trivia, because you mentioned Marcus's mother, we, not a lot of people know that we have all these letters between Marcus Aurelius and Fronto, and also between Fronto and other people that Marcus knew. And one of the, th I think more people should maybe at least glance at those, because even though they don't have a lot of philosophical content, one of the things that would strike people is how affectionate Marcus Aurelius is in real life. It's an incredible window into the real private life of a Roman emperor, which in itself is an extraordinary thing to have in our possession. And, you know, Marcus is far more affectionate towards his friends and family th than most people would even consider it normal today. Um, you know, he's very expressive about his, uh, his love and affection towards him. And, and Fronto praises Marcus and his mother for possessing this quality called uh, philistergia that it's hard to translate into English, but it kind of, so usually translated as natural affection. It can mean uh, family affection, a paternal affection. And Fronto says there's no word in Latin for this. He goes, because Roman nobles generally lack it. He says rather bitterly, except for you guys. A bit of shame, yeah. You know, like, he thinks that you guys, um, Marcus and his mum, have this to an exceptional degree. And that shines through in the letters. So Stoics aren't like Mr. Spock or a robot or whatever. Mm -hmm. Even in the ancient world, they frequently said Stoicism is not, as they phrase it, about having a heart of stone or being like a, a man of stone. You know, like Stoics have feelings too, Anya. I just Even want to add, to, I think that's absolutely right. If I could just add, um, you know, some of the neglect, I think, in the uh, in, in the pre rock and roll era, Donald, yeah. uh, uh, it, it is due to the academy, but also that is um, easy to teach Aristotle Plato because they're there in big volumes uh, and translated. There's a history of translation, you know, great, great translations coming typically out of Oxford and Cambridge. Um, but the Stoics were all fragments, so a little bit like teaching the pre-Socratics. It, it just wasn't stuff, except, of course, for the Romans, and that's why they're very popular, um, Seneca, Epictetus, um, and um, Marcus Aurelius. Those, and, and they were transmitted through generations in bedside reading, by and large, for throughout history. The others weren't, but the others are really where you get this stuff, and it takes, so the you know, having grown up in the ancient philosophy world, you just, doing a patient, you didn't read ancient Greek Stoics because you couldn't get your hands on these little fragments. It took David Sedley and, and, um, and Richard Sarabji to put together selections and translations that you could kind of teach. But where that was a selection. They made the cuts, they made the calls, they organized, you know? But I, I do think one of the persons that doesn't get enough um, attention is Seneca. I, he is the master writer in my view. I mean, that's why he was brought out of eight years of, of um, exile in Corsica by Agrippina, Nero's mother, because she wanted someone who was so good in letters to teach her son and maybe morally educate him. That didn't work so well. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but, but he also built, um, Seneca builds community through letter writing. He's, he writes letters, if not every day, you know, to kind of in an epistolary relationship. He doesn't send them, but it's sort of a model stuff mm -hmm. of what you're doing. Um, he talks a lot about, you know, um, it's self counsel but it's, but I do it through you, um, that sort of thing. And so the community, I think, is really critical. The, the idea of self-reliance, stiff upper lip you mentioned, Anya, um, actually probably an American phrase, not a British phrase, um, is a distortion because the critical to stoicism is the idea that we're in a connected community. It's sort of a, we're parts of a whole. You might not like the idea, but we're in a body, this big body. It's kind of almost like a pantheistic body. We're all in it. And we're all parts of it. And the one metaphor I love from Marcus Aurelius is, you know, you got to get, I think he had a good orthodontist. You got to get your yeah. top teeth and your bo bottom teeth working together. <laughs> um, and that's sort of how it has to go. And so that idea of connection, I think, is 
really deep in the soul of stoicism and it is for us to build communities whether in person if you're in a classroom or you know online if you're not um but i do think seneca's letters are just a gift um and they're just so wonderful or the two on benefits the which is about gratitude which is something we all need and raise and i think there's a lot there in the ancient sources I think it's kind of ironic in some ways that stoicism is sort of being marketed as self-help now because it, it is actually more about building a community. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk about letters a, a bit more actually, it, it, but before that, Nancy, I wanted to ask you as well, you brought up a few points beforehand when we were talking or writing emails, writing letters back and forth, um, is the idea of mentorship as well. And that kind of having an important role in the stoic world. I think of it all the time. Um, mentorship was their model, you know, they got it from Socrates, Socrates um, taught virtue through friendship, uh, in his case, very close relationships with young boys, but the idea of counseling was, was there because you're, you're making moral progress, that, or you're trying to, it's a philosophy of aspiration, it's aspirational, striving, we're not just thinking about the outcome, but um, moving forward if we can. And we and virtue is central. So self help, if it's just feel good, no, it you know it's not that. It's it's be good, not just feel good. It's be good, and that you know have some virtue or what the Greeks call arete, um, excellence of the psyche, and or, or character excellence. A better translation, I think. And they um, think of that in terms of um, you know, having teachers um, in various ways who know maybe know a little bit more than you, but maybe they're just a mirror for you. Aristotle has wonderful ideas about a friend is another self because you can see yourself more clearly through your friend. So it could be like that or parenting and children. I can't think of a more intimate relationship in some ways um, than that. Um, and, but also where you're exposed the vulnerability is so raw in close friendships, you know? And so um, you're kind of having to test that friendship relationship. I, just uh, 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 very briefly, my mom um, never wanted to face death. We were very close. So this is daughter, mother. And I had to talk to her. She's age, approaching 97. She's in a nursing home. I did a kind of Epictetus thing. I said, mom, but with laughter. So I said, mom, just remind me, did we sign you up for the immortality plan? Because if we did, it's gonna be really expensive. Well, I got her attention immediately. It was a joke and it was a dance. So it was the relationship of a dance. Um, we were partnering in a funny moment. Um, that's, that's a non-traumatizing pre-rehearsal preparation <laughs> with humor. Well, and, and, you know, writing letters back and forth, this seems to be a good tactic for people to address difficult situations. And, and that was going to be, as we were saying before about letters um, in, in Wise Up, it's, it's a series of letters to, to your son, Duff. So it, is, is that a good tactic for interacting between and, and approaching these difficult questions? Or, and why, why letters specifically? Well, I find that I communicate communicate most effectively with my left hand. Um, and uh, I started writing letters to my son before he arrived. You know, your mother is your first home. And I figured, welcome to the world. I mean, you know, you spend three trimesters in utero. And then I was like, this is now our fourth trimester. So we're all in our fourth trimester together. Um, I have a habit of writing letters, um, and it's part of my very kind of small choice of every day, uh, to, the choice to be useful or useless, and I try to get as many useful days on a ledger, but there are days when I am roped to the sofa like Gulliver and I cannot really participate in society, so the way I do it is write letters. So I make a habit, and this is going on 30 years, where I write a letter every day to some random person. And it's not about reciprocity, so it's not an email. And I just try and thank somebody. 
just thank random people in the newspaper. I'll pick somebody or, you know, it's you know, fan letters to uh, authors I admire. I just and you get send the letters. Letter. And you yes, send them? I do. I do with no return because it's not about igniting a new relationship. It's just a moment to say, that was awesome. Well done. Uh, and I find, you know, so much, um, you know, we were talking about how stoicism has really had this renaissance kind of like broicism, like it's a, it's a lot of tech bros and uh, journaling. And I kind of think, well, you know, if I'm writing and I'm thinking, maybe I can just take a little bit of that and then send it through the U.S. Post and see what happens. Well, being the U.S. Post, you don't know if it's ever going to get there. So That's it's true. <laughs> that was a gamble. <laughs> no, no. Um, but and you, you mentioned journalism, uh, journal using journals and such. And I, I was going to ask that maybe to Donald, because I know that's a very common tactic for, for stoicism to say, you know, we should be writing journals. Um, and obviously Marcus Aurelius's meditations is a journal. But is there something hugely different psychologically, maybe of the act of writing to somebody rather than like to yourself? Yeah, I think um, there are many benefits to be gained from journaling and there are different ways of doing it. I guess it's quite a broad concept. So it used to be that people thought writing in a journal was kind of cathartic and it would allow them to vent their emotions and stuff. And that idea is kind of not as popular these days in, in modern psychotherapy. It's a bit of an older view of how emotions work. But there are many other things that go on when people write. I mean, one is that when people are writing about their experiences, it allows them to reflect on them and process them more slowly and from a different perspective. And uh, I think when you address your thoughts to another person as well, it can help us to gain uh, a kind of objectivity um that we don't get as become so as quite as introspective and lost in our own thoughts when we imagine that we might potentially be communicating them to someone else the, there are a number of ways that the stoics used writing there's a really fleeting reference uh, when i wrote my first book on stoicism i tried to list all the psychological techniques i could find and i missed one um there was only one that i've noticed since that i completely missed and it's an epictetus and uh, he says there's a guy called Paconius Agrippinus, who is uh, a Roman senator um, from a previous generation. And he used to write, Epictetus says, eulogies, letters to himself, praising setbacks. Uh, so death or disease, he'd write letters to himself, focusing, turning them into a positive experience, you know, making lemonade out of them. Um, so he was the guy that uh, Nero banished and uh, he was about to have lunch with his friends and he said well <laughs> oh there's a there's a nice place on the road to uh, to the port we can stop off there in the countryside and have a picnic instead so he kind of turned it into a positive experience and this is something that the, the Stoics allude to it's another way of using writing uh, to decatastrophize events and reframe them um, by focusing on the, the, the positive aspects of uh, what seems at first like a, a terrible catastrophe. I, on just that subject, post-traumatic growth is one another uh, hip term right now. And there's something about certainly seeing the positive, but it's not as if you want to wish trauma on anyone or, mm -hmm. um, or suffering or, or any of that. Um, and do we hope to find lessons from very difficult things and not be chronically in stuck. Yeah. But I'll just say, say I, I interviewed Stockdale once, um, actually oh. several times, Admiral Stockdale. And he, um, he was with his wife who herself was a tour de force. She was the person who met in Washington DC to get the POWs out of Vietnam. She met with McNamara and Robert McNamara. Anyway, she said, uh, he said, you know, seven and a half years of, so of being a POW and two and a half in leg irons, solitary in leg irons. I'd do it again for this guy, Epictetus. 
<laughs> to learn it. And he he very much felt it was he was um, a mirror image of himself in some ways. And running in came Sybil from another room, and she'd say, "I get I get my I get my freedom and health in a different way." <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, having suffered herself his years. So I think we have to sometimes not glamorize. Not, that's the wrong word. Um, I'm for repair. Um, but, you know, we grow in different ways. We go two steps backwards, one step forward. You know, there's lots of bubbles and, and, and bumps in the road all, all around. That's, that's the beauty of having the the words written down by Epictetus I mean and and I mean he didn't write them, but that, that, that we have this wealth of wisdom and knowledge that we can read that we can study it and hopefully we can get those insights without going through being prisoners of war I, I mean in ideal situation so I mean if you do go through it it's best to to try to take out of it what you can but if you don't hopefully you can learn from it Otherwise, um, I, I'd love to, to take some questions from the audience now because we've, we've got quite a few people who've been writing in and I just wanna start off with one comment. Um, I've never heard of broism before, I, but I've encountered that idea in the day-to-day. -day. It's good to hear from our experts how to make stoicism more approachable. So thanks for throwing in some local lingo. Um, but uh, one of the first questions actually for, for Duff is, do you write poems, poetry? Um. I do. I mean, I have, but uh, I, um, I I do not focus on poems. Not right now. Perhaps in the future. But thank you for asking. We um we also have a couple of questions about the rise, this renaissance of Stoicism, um, that uh, maybe Nancy or Donald, you guys can answer to. Why do you think Stoicism has boomed in popularity? I'll just say. Oh, Donald, please go ahead. Oh, I, uh, it's a long answer. I've been asked that many times before, and there are a bunch of reasons. I think cognitive behavioral therapy is, in a sense, one of the things, because it lends legitimacy to stoic ideas. There was a time when people sneered at the psychological advice in stoicism, and the followers of Freud and, and the people that came after him really thought this type of advice was terrible and discouraged people. But, but actually, we now know it's pretty good psychological advice. So that made a big difference. And then there are authors like Ryan Holiday has sold so many books on Stoicism that he, you know, he alone has reached a, a vast audience. And then you've got guys like Tim Ferriss that, that mentions Stoicism and, and reach a whole different demographic as well. Um, so those are some of the reasons. Also, I remember when the movie Gladiator came out, weirdly, that there were there was a whole wave of people that started reading the meditations of Marcus Aurelius because Richard Harris portrays Marcus Aurelius in the in the first act of Gladiator, although that's ages ago now. That was about 20 years ago or something that that movie came out. Here's another bit of trivia for you, by the way. They're making a sequel to Gladiator. And also John Malkovich is uh, playing Seneca in a, a movie called The Creation of Earthquakes that, that should be coming out in the next few years. You always get the Hollywood trivia on stuff. Oh, the Hollywood. Yeah, <laughs> we once had a whole podcast where we were just doing like Hollywood <laughs> gossip and trying to figure out who would play who. I, it was blessed. Um, <laughs> Uh, the yeah, it, but it, it is fantastic that it's become more popular, and um, I think a lot of that has been a lot of books and literature has come out. And so, one question that has come up by a few people um, is for requests of recommended reading. Um, one was for high school students, um, and I might add, Duff, do you, I think your book would have been, would be great for high school students. I mean, it's written to your son, so I think that age bracket. Would you say that's appropriate for that age bracket? Absolutely. And um, I think it's universal, but I also think like go to the original source material. Uh, it's, it, 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 you, I feel like, again, you know, my goal use is trying to be useful and less dense. And you, know, you don't get wise by accident. Like the same way you can lose weight, but you won't uh, by accident without purpose, but you won't gain muscle without purpose. So having a reading plan is really important. And I think that um, if your goal is um, you know, to challenge yourself, 
you know, have a reading plan. And, you know, I think absolutely read Donald's oeuvre. And um, uh, I greatly enjoy Massimo's work and, and Nancy's. And uh, there is a rich source of syllabus. I mean, and, and, and it's all right there on your site and classical wisdom to find information about. Great, but it'd be great to have a syllabus from all of us. I love that idea. I'm definitely going to do that. And because I think um, Stoic Wisdom by Nancy and How to Think Like a Roman Emperor by Donald are also excellent, excellent books. Um, and, and it would be great to break it up into kind of age ranges, brackets, specific things, because there's some people asking for recommended reading on CBT. Donald's new book. Donald's new book coming out next month, is it? Um, Donald, is that coming up? You'll have to pronounce the name for me. I still struggle with it. Dressmas, it comes out in the 14th of June. So it's because it's a graphic novel. I think a lot of people think that teens are like, uh, and I guess maybe a different uh, group of people might be interested in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. I'd also say when you're reading these books, Donald's or Jeff's or, or mine, um, and this is a tip that just came from a college professor who was using my book to tether it, anchor it with the text. I, I just can't. I'm with you, Duff. Um, the text, the Epictetus' is, um, uh, text is one of them is very tiny. Uh, Seneca's letters are out there and about. <clears throat> um, a lot of stuff is open source. Just read the originals, whatever the, the dosing you can handle. <laughs> it's so approachable. And, um, you know, just like I think everyone should read Plato's apology about Socrates. Not everyone does, but so approachable. So um, a, a plug for classical wisdom. <laughs> well, we did, a, we did a podcast recently. Uh, I haven't released it yet, too, also with David Feidler, who did um, Breakfast with Seneca. And, uh, you know, his whole idea, too, is just, you know, read a letter in the morning over breakfast. And like Duff, you're saying at, at your breakfast table, no tech. You can get... <clears throat> Stoicism and ancient philosophy, even in very bite-sized things. And the idea of just, you know, putting down that cell phone one or two times less out of the hundred times that we pick it up a day and instead picking up a book uh, and just reading a, a, even a fragment, you know, um, classical. And we also have like the essential classics, uh, which is a great anthology. And it's broken up into, it's of all the Greco-Roman literature. And, and it's just, you know, smaller chapters. So it's very... Um, readable in our today's world where we're very busy. Um, but I'd love to, I'd like to actually bring up a kind of controversial question. Um, and this is, I don't know, maybe people are going to have very different opinions on it, but let's go controversial every now and then, right? Uh, this is one of the reader questions re regarding VAD, which you know they're Australian because Australians make acronyms of everything. Um, voluntary assisted di dying. Um, and that is apparently a big I, item in Australia right now, uh, and they're about to have a, a vote on it. So um, our audience member all the way in Australia would like to ask, how does stoicism relate to voluntary assistant dying? So I'll, I'll leave that to whoever, whomever wants to answer it. Well, I'll just begin. Um, they don't specifically talk about it. There, well, there are suicides and forced suicides. It's um, not a, um, it's a different culture. Um, so you have to put that in mind. Um, whereas someone like Kant in the 18th century really thought the only time you could commit suicide would be if uh, a dog bit you and you were going to be rabid. And that would mean that you would do something immoral in your actions. But out of despair or unhappiness, you know, he, the uh, the pietist was not going for that different world for the, um, many of the suicides you see, including Seneca's and this amazing picture of Reuben, uh, of Rubens, um, where Seneca's um, committing suicide, surrounded by friends, was a forced suicide, you know, on the orders of Nero. So there's a lot of forced suicides, um, that banishment or suicide. So it's political intrigue. That's a bit off, and it leads to a different view, but it also leads to the fact that they're thinking about this stuff a lot. It's in their minds, and it's not as uh, um, the mortality of your life in highly uh, a difficult political times where there's intrigue and power 
and corruption, enormous corruption, as well as sickness, um, is on their, it's, it's just, they're not blinded by it. It's there all the time. So I think that's a refreshing way to think a little bit about it. it um, they're, you know, whether or not they're thinking about the, 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 the pain, it's also the pressures of being very vulnerable in a political, in a politically charged world, stuff can happen to you. So that's, I think it is, it is refreshing. And I think we have very um, uh, restrictive mindsets when we think about how we approach our own lives, how we make our wishes clear to others whom we love, and also the medical profession, you know, which can, who can get very litigious and, you know, they're, they are worried about their professions as well. Uh, I was a, a, a grief counselor um, and a hospice chaplain. Uh, with the hospitals closing, I haven't practiced uh, in a while, but um, being very close to death, and I think, you know, memento mori, remember too, that you shall die. When I was in the hospital, um, I had, as a journalist, I'd interviewed Dr. Kevorkian, um, a well-known American uh, pathologist who created the uh, Thantos machine, which was a, essentially a death machine. And we did a story on him and we called it, he was called Dr. Death. And we called it a day with Dr. Life. And I got to know Dr. Kevorkian. And so when I was in the hospital, I asked him if he would send me a photo. And I had it framed and put over my hospital bed while I was in residency in the neurological, neurological ward. And so my doctors would come in and be like, oh, what's this? And I was like, oh, it's Dr. Kevorkian. I was gonna have him come in for a second opinion. And they were like, yeah, we don't like this guy. So uh, I believe that um, for this stoic, I believe memento mori, remember you too, that you shall die. Remember that life is perishable. You know, that time is our treasure. So it's up to us to live every day that we can. Is it that Seneca quote, sometimes living is an act of courage? Mm -hmm. I love that. True. Um, yeah, and it, it's, it's, it is a, it's a complicated question, but it is something that we have to contemplate because, you know, we don't get out of this thing alive um, mm -hmm. in life. And it is a, it is a fatal disease that's sexually contracted. Um, but we, as a result, we do have to contemplate death. And it's always a question I've sort of wondered and, and I've asked and I'd love to, to hear um, any of your opinions on is, is how do we contemplate death and familiarize ourselves with it without being morbid or anxious? How do we find that balance? Can I just say just one thing? Everyone is different. We forget, but we all have very different temperaments that we're wired differently. And you, as a parent, you, you see this the moment your kid comes out almost. It's, um, or if you have more than one, you just sort of see constitution or temperament. And so stoicism is very much about volitional control and deaf embraces it in the most emblematic way. So, um, but other people have slightly different dispositions and it, whether we call it harder work or not so hard work or don't have the funny bone um, <laughs> or, you know, we're around dour people or uh, who knows what you inherit and what you make of it and, and how it goes and what your challenges are. And all that comes to be a kind of mix. And, you know, that's, that's in part why psychotherapy is with a really, really good counselor is so important. They get to know you. You're in a trust relationship. You're not just mirroring off of yourself or off of texts. There's, it's a long rapport and you get exposed and who you are idiosyncratically. No universal soldier, no universal patient. They're just, we're all different. And so what works for some in facing death or thinking about suicide and the fear just doesn't always work for others. And so advice giving, self-help, 
sort of cookie cutter stuff, I actually worry about a little bit. I do think it's a, or it has to be personalized just as we're in intimate relationships and they make all the difference. And when you have some history, as Aristotle says, you know, you can't have too many friendships, it gets diluted and you need them for a long period of time so you can build that thing. I, I think to getting to know yourself through another who may be a professional at times or, or really wise friend <laughs> who will call is helpful. And I do think we have to remember that what works for one doesn't always work for others. And whether it means that you pay for a professional <laughs> or give an hour, for example, this remarkable service online founded by a woman who made psychotherapy available in part for veterans um, at, at no cost, all, all of that. I, I, so I'm for the profession of mental health because I do think, um, we need people who will be really wise, but trained. I think that's really well said. And I think it's, you know, knowing that everybody is going to be in different situations and, and people have to find their own path um, that, that might be individual to the person is, is very important. I'd also add, though, that I feel like our current society is very detached from natural processes of life and death. Um, and that we've taken these very normal human activities and we've sort of put them in isolated white boxes in hospitals. And it means that we're so much more afraid of them because we don't have any interaction. And I think, you know, the first time I experienced any birth was when I gave birth. And that in any traditional society for the vast majority of places, for the vast majority of history, I would have been assisting in a birth. I would have seen it. I would have known what to do. It wouldn't have been this thing that I just had no idea about. Um, and I think that's true for death as well. Like we we are so detached from the natural process of, it was something like up until like the 1920s, I think it was, and I, don't quote me on these deaths because I'm really bad at remembering exact number, but it was something like 90% of deaths happened at the home. And now 90% of deaths happen at a hospital. If you had held your grandmother's hand when she died, would you have a different experience of death than if it just happened separate from where we are? Um, and it, I don't know if there's any answer or solution to that because our current society doesn't really allow it as much, but maybe even just being aware of that, that we maybe there are ways that we can familiarize ourselves with these natural processes that might take away a bit of the fear of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they um, say like, uh, you know, you only live once. Actually, you only die once. We live every day. So switching that around a little bit. And Nancy, what you were saying about self-help also, uh, I found this uh, from the 70s, um, a document, a, a thesis, and it was called the Oracle at the Supermarket. And it was about self-help. And it was a study that the reason why self-help is somewhat ineffectual is because the reward center of your brain lights up just for buying the book, not applying the, the, the principles. And I thought that was very interesting. That, uh, like the diet book, one, st one step <laughs> to the diet. <laughs> I know, like diets, they should be an entertainment. It's not science. Can I just say, I, I said this to, to, to Nancy and Duff beforehand, um, but also Donald, that, you know, in preparation to this event, I, I, it was so rewarding for me because I got to read Duff's book, but I also, you know, and I picked up a bunch of the original texts as well. And I, you know, I got out Epictetus and I, you know, started reviewing Marcus Aurelius and, and, you know, people might get that reward center buzzing when they buy the book, but genuinely, it is so good to just sit down and read texts again and read the books, whether you're reading the originals or any of your three excellent books. It is so much more rewarding. And yes, that cell phone is tempting and it buzzes and it bings and it rings, but just put it in another room and get a book out one night and you will genuinely feel so much happier for it um, in a meaningful way. I, I, I really feel but uh, Donald, I'd like to ask 
a question to you um this and and you guys can also chime in because i feel like everybody will have some thoughts on it but i've seen a regular theme over and over again since sort of delving into this topic of stoicism is people dealing with loss um and it's kind of a very regular one we have our own fear of death but in some ways i think people are more afraid of the death of others than ourselves um, and would you have any kind of good pointers or any words to, to, for people sort of struggling with that? Yeah, I think that it is one of the main themes that we find in the Stoic literature. And there's a genre of literature in the ancient world called consolation letters that come in a variety of forms. Several of Seneca's letters are consolation letters. Um, Plutarch writes consolation, consolation letters. And then we have other uh, ancient sources in this genre as well. And some of the advice they give kind of seems a bit harsh because people had different, uh, people are more familiar with loss in the ancient world. I mean, here's an example. Marcus Aurelius had 14 children and half of them died before he did. Um, so, you know, the loss of children was like a fairly familiar experience. And, and like you said, you know, people were more exposed to seeing death in their, in their home and around them. So, I, I mean, I think one of the lessons of Stoicism is to be prepared for the possibility of loss, um, to view it from a more philosophical perspective. The Stoics say that rather than saying we've lost something, we should say that we've returned it to nature and kind of adopt the mindset that it was always to be expected. Um, they say that we should view people and the the goods that we possess as being on loan to us and so always view them as transient kind of like buddhists having this philosophy of impermanence um the stoics want us right from the outset to view the good things in life um as being fragile in a sense and, and transient you know to avoid becoming overly attached to them and also viewing things within a broader perspective they have this idea of the view from above in Stoicism, but in many levels in Stoicism, the, the Stoics want us generally to widen our perspective chronologically and spatially and see things as, as part of a, a larger story about our lives and about the, the, the history of the human race. Yeah, I think that's really wonderful, the, the expanding outward um, as well as um, through time. Um, but in addition, you know, they, this idea of preparing yourself, thinking a little bit in advance in increments, titrated, it's titrated medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, you break a jug in your kitchen, not great. I didn't really, I love it. it. You know, the next one, the, the bathhouse is noisy. Well, I was thinking there may be pickpockets and gossips, um, says Epictetus. Um, the next one is I'm, you know, there could be death. My child is mortal. I kiss her goodbye in the morning, knowing that. That's the harder one, but you kind of gradually, or you throw in these mental reservations. I'll, I'll dance with my husband at, you know, our 50th anniversary, unless, you know, there's an unless. <laughs> so you, you hedge your bets a little bit, um, you know, or, or, you know, that now they have in mind that if you're really wise, you can track in advance almost because you're so omniscient, what, what is going to happen and what, uh, uh, and what um, you're currently going through. So you, you're always, so uh, you got veridical perception. You're, you're, you got it. We're not as lucky, we're fallible. <laughs> Descartes told us we are fallible. Um, but we can try to be nimble. I always think stoicism is the philosophy of agility, mental agility. It's about being adaptive because you're not, stuck that's Donald used that idea you're the way you attach to your children to what you love to to homes like Kiev Kartov there's a way in which you attach where it's not desperate it it's very hard you know we come from a tradition if you think of Freud's word for attachment it was cathexis in Greek it means hold on to and we come from that and it's very, you know, from an attachment and loss perspective, that's what psych psychotherapy has been about, attachment and loss. Well, they're trying to let you loosen your grip a little bit, whether it's of things, stuff, or dear ones or your own life. It's sort of about lessons and loosening your grip. And I find that probably the most inspiring 
it's hard. But you know, you, you get many days, many days to try it. It's not just <laughs> one shot. It's a life. Mm -hmm. it's I love what, um, what you said about uh, that uh, the people that we love, they are on loan and they will be returned to, to nature. Uh, when I was studying um, to be a hospice chaplain, it was within the Buddhist tradition. And you know, the big concept that we were taught was attachment is suffering. And uh, it was a very illuminating experience. Um, and uh, yes, we are all works in progress. I, I have had seen quite a few questions asking about the, the relationship between Stoicism and Buddhism um, and how connected they are. I didn't realize you uh, focused on Buddhism. That's very interesting. Yes, I'm Catholic and uh, the Pope of Rome really doesn't let women do too much. So I spoke to my priest buddy and I was like, what do you say I just switched jerseys just so I can try and do some good. Um, uh, what I really love uh, is uh, the way that uh, Christianity is so inspired by Stoic Stoicism uh, with St. Augustine of Hippo. And uh, so these texts have inspired so many cultures, so many traditions. Um, and I'm not as skillful in the Buddhist tradition. I really, um, that is also a work in progress. Well, guys, I think you guys have been so gracious for your time. I'd like to end with uh, just a quick fun question. Um, for each of one of you is who is your favorite stoic and what do you think they would think of our current society right now? Okay, well, modern stoics are right here. I've got the uh, two of the my Mount Rushmore. Um, ancient stoic uh, Epictetus is my main man. I think, you know, living with chronic pain, I, 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 I almost he is a mentor and Donald told me this great story about how the message or the word mentor uh, comes from the Odyssey where is it a uh, Athena dresses up as a man Mr. Mentor uh, right. so uh, I think Epictetus again would be cheering us on and understanding that again we are the sum of our choices and a big choice was to spend some time today with us. And so I thank the audience for tuning in and giving, um, uh, sharing their time with us. So thank you. Donald, do you wanna go next? Oh yeah, I'm gonna pick a kind of unorthodox one then. I, I'll, um, I have a lot, I, I have a, a lot of love for my, my colleagues in modern stores, I mean, including, you know, uh, you three ladies, um, but uh, the, I'm going to pick a kind of precursor of Stoicism and, and say Socrates is really my favourite guy. Um, he's someone I'm kind of writing about a bit at the moment. I think if Socrates was around today, he would say that we don't question things deeply enough. Uh, we don't ask questions enough of ourselves, examine our, our own lives deeply enough and focus in particular on the most important uh, questions in life about what is wisdom and what is justice and so on. And we don't do enough to, to share uh, that wisdom with other people by helping them to examine their lives as well. So I think Socrates, you know, the, that's his character, obviously, and the Platonic dialogues. I, I, I think he would say we talk a lot, but we don't really talk enough about, like today we were talking about our own mortality. You know, people don't talk enough about these really profound, deep questions in life. He'd want us to do more of that. Nancy, can you finish us up? Who's your favorite? Sure. I'm, well, it's going to be go back as well. For me, it's Aristotle. Um, I think Aristotle is the most brilliant philosopher of how to live a good life. Um, because while he didn't have the bright stripes and all the newfangled terminology that we got through the Stoics, um, he really understood that relationships uh, and philia, um, friendship, were at the heart 
of how you flourish and how you make it and survive. And, and um, so I, I think he's sort of the pivot point from Socrates who didn't write anything to Plato and Plato to the Stoics. He is the pivot and it's who the Stoics are reacting to. They want him to clean up his act when it comes to <laughs> getting all the uh, stuff in order. But I, I think he is so inspiring. A little harder to read, but not, the ethics are just, Nicobacan ethics are brilliant. So that's where I'll put my money. It's, it's hard, but it's worthwhile. You, it's, it's like climbing a really steep mountain, but you get there, the view's fantastic, right? <laughs> Now, um, before everybody uh, goes, I just want to say two quick things. One, uh, if you enjoyed this event, we have uh, some more events coming up. Um, I'm doing another one called The Love of Learning with um, the founder of the Scala Foundation, um, Margarita Mooney uh, and Alexandra Hudson. So that's going to be happening on April 27th. And then the next event after that is a really big, exciting one um, called Ancient Philosophy Comes Alive. And that is on May 21st. And that is with the Plato's Academy Center and will include our own Donald Robertson and Nancy Sherman, um, along with Angie Hobbs, uh, John Sellers. We have like a really cool whole conference event that is gonna be helping promote Plato's Academy Center, which Donald references is, is we're working on the reconstruction of, and it's really a chance to be part of history um, and part of a, a really great legacy. Um, so you can come find that on Plato's Academy Center. Uh, just, just Google that and you'll find us. Um, and I just also wanna say thank you so much to Sean Kelly. He's part of the Classical Wisdom team behind the scenes who's been helping with the, the tech. Um, with I want to thank Modern Stoicism and the Marcus Aurelius Foundation for helping uh, promote this event and letting people know about it. I want to thank our fantastic panelists. Um, and I also want to tell everybody to check out Wise Up. Um, it really was a, a very, very enjoyable book. Um, and also look up Nancy's books and Donald's books. I mean, we, I'm just thrilled to have had such an awesome panel. You guys have been wonderful. Your insights invaluable. And I hope everybody has enjoyed learning as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, it's been a pleasure. Honor. Yeah, our pleasure, my pleasure. And to the audience as well. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you, John. And everyone have, I hope everybody's had a long weekend ahead of you. Um, so have, enjoy the, the holiday season. It's Santa Semana here in South America. So uh, everybody uh, have a wonderful weekend and thanks for joining us. Thank you.